Ugh. It is a crappy, rainy Florida summer day today. But when the weather sucks, it's a great day to start a new project. So that's what we're gonna do today. Today we're gonna start a new surfboard project. Um, we've done a few of those so far on the, oh, there's some lightning. We've done a few of these so far on the channel, but we've got a new challenge today. Instead of fixing up an old surfboard, today we're gonna make a brand new surfboard from scratch. Man, it is dumping out there. I had to get inside to get out of the rain, even though I'm already pretty much soaked. Just a quick reminder, these videos are brought to you by Waterless, which is a company we started while in graduate school. Um, we're actually marine scientists by training and thought, man, it'd be really cool to incorporate marine science and conservation topics into clothing that you can wear out on the water. So we make shirts, board shorts, leggings, swimsuits, hats, all the kind of functional gear you use for a fun day on the water. We use environmentally responsible materials and we incorporate species and ecosystems in need into each product. So definitely get over to waterless.com and check it out. We really, really appreciate your support, but enough about that, let's get into the board build. So you might be asking yourself, why should we be building a brand new board from scratch when we can just buy a new one from a surf company or go pick up a used board on OfferUp or Craigslist? That's a very legitimate question. Um, if you can find a board that suits your needs, like if you're a beginner and you're just getting into the sport, buying a used board is an awesome play. I totally am supportive of that. And I buy used boards and offer up all the time. You can see other videos on this channel of uh, me fixing up old boards, bringing them back to life. That is totally the right thing to do. Um, if you're just getting into it and you're just kind of feeling out a different design, or if you know what you want, if you know there's a specific board that you want and there's a, a shaper that's making that board, by all means, support your local shapers, um, get a board from a professional. There's, there's no better way to get a high, per, high performance board than from a trained expert. But if you find yourself in a situation like I'm currently in, where you have an idea for a board, something maybe a little bit unorthodox, um, something that maybe doesn't exist on the market, uh, it's really, really fun and actually incredibly cost effective to just build the board yourself. Um, I think a lot of people might think that building a surfboard is like way too complicated for them, but it's not. It's totally an approachable project. And uh, that's what we're gonna go through here today. So this video is really intended for, for people that either just wanted to try building a board just for the fun, the novelty of, of the engineering experience, or for people that sort of in the, in the boat that I'm in where you have a specific idea of a board that you want and you can't find um, any shapers that, that are currently making it. And also in today's supply chain crisis, I had a really hard time trying to find any local shapers that would make it. They're all so slammed with back orders, they just didn't have time. So I found myself in kind of a pickle and thought, you know what, I'm tired of waiting, I'm just gonna make this thing myself. So. That's what this video is for. And uh, first we're gonna talk about sort of like the outline of the things we're gonna talk about. So quick overview of what we're gonna cover in this process. Step number one is going to be the design phase where we're gonna use computer software to actually design the surfboard. Um, I'm gonna talk about the different types of softwares that are available, including some really high quality free open source software that you can download and use. Um, step two is gonna be taking that shape and translating it into a foam blank. And we're gonna use a CNC machine for this. Now, that might be a little bit controversial. You might be saying, Patrick, that's a bit of a cop-out. You're not really showing us how to, how to shape the foam. And I'm doing this for a reason. I don't know how to shape a surfboard. It, there's an art to it. You have to really hone your skills over a long period of time to, to take a concept, especially like the first prototype, and, and turn it into a really high quality board. Um, if you want to make a board that, that goes from a design on the computer and actually turns out to be what you want it to be, I highly recommend using a CNC machine and it's shockingly affordable. Um, finding a local CNC machine and getting a blank and having it cut is really not expensive. So this is the route I'm going. I realize that some people might want to have that hand shaping experience themselves. They might want to get a foam block, cut out the outline, do the contours, all that kind of stuff. Um, if that's what you're after, this video is not for you. Um, we're gonna rely on CNC cutting to take what we got from the computer and translate it to the foam. Once the board is cut, we're gonna talk about prepping the foam, um, finishing the board off, getting it ready for sealing. We're gonna seal the board with a little bit of spackle before fiberglassing. Then we're gonna fiberglass the board, 
And we're gonna walk you through every step of the process. We're gonna do some, some color in the uh, fiberglass job to make it you know, really colorful and bright. We're gonna install the components, the fin boxes, leashes, uh, and then we're gonna finish it off um, and get it ready. It's, it's really not that complicated of a process. So hopefully um, after all is said and done, you'll see it and go, man, I can build a surfboard. So first step, let's get in, let's get to the computer and let's talk about the different softwares. All right, here we are in the computer and I'm gonna do just like kind of a brief presentation, kind of walking you through my design process um, for making a custom board. Um, I'm gonna avoid showing the screens of the actual software just to make sure I don't get sued for copyright infringement. Um, I'm just gonna kind of use basic diagrams that I've made myself. So we start with wanting to shape a surfboard. The first thing you need is shaping software. And there really are three options on the market um, that are the most popular. The first is called BoardCAD, where CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. And it is an open source free software. So it's my favorite one. I like it. It's free. It's intuitive, um, but it's also pretty basic. It has some pretty basic um, instruction manuals. Um, probably the fanciest one and the most advanced one is Shape 3D. And Shape 3D has a light version you can use for free, but a lot of the features are uh, not enabled, um, or you can pay for various versions of it. Um, definitely the most powerful of the three, I think. And then there's AccuShaper, which is pretty similar to Shape 3D. Um, I do believe you also have to pay for it, um, but I think they may also have a light version or a trial period um, you can use. Um, so for my usages, I like I like BoardCAD. I think BoardCAD gets a lot um, a lot of what you need done. I like some of the features. Um, I like a lot of the um, community aspect of it. Anytime you have open source uh, software you tend to have some creative people um, using it and contributing to the community. So I really like that. Um, but it's also limited. Um, sometimes if you're exporting a board to a CNC machine, it doesn't have maybe the file structure that the CNC machine that you're using has. So that's just something to keep in mind. You can um, transfer files between BoardCAD and the other softwares, even the light softwares and then export the file types. Um, some, there, there are some games you can play there. So if you have any questions about that, like file structure, um, specific stuff like that, by all means, put them in the comments below and I'm happy um, to answer them because we will need to jump maybe between BoardCAD and Shape 3D Lite at times in this. Um, so if you need those specific tips, let me know, but in, it is possible. So once you have download the software, install it on co your computer, uh, the next thing that's really important is to start studying up on surfboard theory. It's good to understand um, just sort of the basics of how surfboards work. And a really good website for this is Swaylox. Swaylox is like a forum where um, kind of do-it-yourself shapers along with professional shapers um, contribute ideas. And it's a really valuable, valuable resource. You can learn a ton on Swaylox about everything about surfboards from the foam to the shape to the the resin you're using so definitely a great resource and also google if you just google questions that you have you'll find so many resources on the internet um, so definitely take some time to 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 study up to look at and think about the kind of board you want to design and uh, learn about the various elements that go into it we'll be talking about them but not in the the level of detail that um, you know, professionals and experts um, will speak about on forums like Swaylock. So definitely look into that. Um, once you've kind of familiarized yourself with, with surfboard design, I think it's, it's good to start with some type of starting shape. So whether you're making a long board, a short board, a mid shape, a fun shape, whatever it may be, it's good to start with sort of like a, a base kind of piece of clay if you're molding the clay into your final form. And a great place to get this, Shape 3D has a, um, a repository of, sh of open source sh uh, shapes that people provide. And the, the URL to get to that is right here. Or if you go to shape3d.com and you just look on the navigation bar for warehouse, you'll click on that. And there's just a bunch of fun different shapes that people have um, provided and shared with the world. And I think that those are a really good place. Like if I want to start with an, if I want to make a mid shape, I'm going to start with a mid shape 
starting shape and then work on from there. If I'm going to start with a, you know, a thrust or a shortboard, I'm going to find one that's sort of like that and then work from there. It just, and I find it's a lot easier to start with one of those base models um, than just starting from scratch. Um, that really saved me a lot, a lot of time. Um, once you have your base model, it's time to move on to step four, which is to modify the outline. And so the outline is if you're looking from the top down or the bottom down, it's the, it's the overall shape of the board, um, how long you want the board, um, just the overall shape, distribution of shape from nose to tail. And there's a lot of tools you can use um, to uh, modify the, the outline of the board. And in, I think, all of the shaping softwares, they have a photo overlay tool, which is really useful. So say you're at the beach or there's a board that you really like or there's an aspect of a board that you really like that you want to mimic, you can get that picture and import it into the software and then sort of use that photo to guide the evolution of your shape. Um, so that's it's one of the more fun parts, I think, of the whole process is, uh, is working on that outline and getting it dialed in, whether again, you want a, a longboard, shortboard, midshape, a kiteboard, a SUP, whatever it may be, um, you can make literally anything. Step number five is to start thinking about the side profile, and that includes the rocker and the thickness. So the rocker here I'm showing crudely, this is just a sketch with the yellow line, is the curvature of the board. Right? So boards, surfboards are not flat, they have curvature uh, that helps them turn, it, it affects how, how well they paddle, if they catch waves well, um, the responsiveness of the board. And then also the thickness distribution. So you actually have how thick the board is, how thick the foam is. And that changes when you go from the nose to the tail and you'll have a, a distribution of foam. And that foam affects uh, how the board floats in the water. Um, you can use the, the photo um, tools in, in uh, these shaping softwares to, to look at side profiles of boards. Um, though this is kind of tricky. Um, because getting a good estimate of a rocker line or of a, a uh, distribution of volume on, on thickness can be kind of hard to, to take off of a photo. Um, so again, that's where maybe that base model is really going to help you uh, find a good place to start for that. And when you combine these two elements, the outline and then the thickness and, and the, the uh, rocker, this is really what's gonna determine the volume of your board. And the volume is really important because uh, it determines uh, how much float you're gonna get, how much upward buoyancy is gonna be created by it, which affects its paddling, um, how easy it is to catch waves, um, all sorts of things. And if you don't understand how uh, buoyancy and, and displacement works, we have a great video that we made um, that explains buoyancy. I'll put it uh, in a link below. And uh, definitely take a look at that because it, it, it explains the, the Archimedes principle and, and why volume affects um, the floatiness of the board um, and why that's important in surfing. We actually have some examples of surfing in the video. So once you've, you've done outline and thickness, you, you'll have the volume of your board and uh, you can find volume calculators. You can go on Google and look at, you know, based on your weight, how heavy you are. Um, there's some good rules of thumb for longboards, midshapes, and shortboards uh, that can help you determine sort of what a ballpark uh, volume you want. And it's always expressed in liters. Um, that's sort of the standard. Um, so definitely doing a little bit of research ahead of time. And depending on what kind of board you want to make, understanding what that volume target is. And then when you're messing around with your outline and your thickness in the software, you can also see in real time how that's changing the volume and just making sure that you're not going too high, you're not going too low, that you're in whatever sweet spot that you that you want. Um, once you've got that done, it's on to step number six, which is to talk about um, bottom contours. And bottom contours are a little bit more of an advanced thing, but they, they really affect how a board, uh, the hydrodynamics of a board goes go through water. And a lot of people might assume if you're kind of in beginning into surfing, you might assume that the bottom of all set surfboards are flat, but that is actually not the case. There's all sorts of fun little um, shapes, including um, concaves, double concaves, bellies, Vs. All of these um, shapes um, make the board feel different. It affects the speed of the board, the response of the board, 
and there's so many different variations. And the bottom contour is also going to evolve usually from the nose of the board to the back. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, this, there's a lot of resources on Swaylox about this. And again, choosing your base, uh, your base board at the very beginning of this process, it may already have some contours built into it that you can work off of. Uh, and I think that's a really good place because personally, I feel a little intimidated by, by bottom contours especially I don't totally know how deep to make them. That can be sort of a hard thing to measure, especially if you're looking at an existing board that you're trying to learn off of. Um, so definitely looking at existing resources and using a good base model um, will make your bottom contour work easier. Once you have your bottom contours done, it's time to look at the rails. Same thing as the bottom contours in that the rails are going to change from the nose of the board to the tail. And there's tons of variability in rails. These are just some crude sketches of them, but you can have basic round rails. You can have symmetric 50-50 rails. You can have asymmetric kind of roll down 60-40s. They always have, they have these interesting funky names to them. And all the rails are gonna have different you know, functionalities at different parts of the board. And again, studying up on the forums and, and really trying to understand how rails function for the type of board you're going to make uh, is really important. I can't I can't give you too many specifics because if you're making a short board, it's going to be a lot different than the long board and so forth. But um, you know, reading reading up and studying up on that stuff uh, will give you a good kind of baseline understanding. Um, and these are basically that's basically it. These are the the main the main um, components that go into a board, and you're going to want to iterate on all of them and tweak. All, all the outline, the profile, the rocker, the bottom contours, and the rails until everything kind of looks good. Um, and to illustrate sort of how this is, how this works, I'll show you kind of what I'm building, why I'm building, my thought process through it, um, and hopefully it kind of illustrates sort of the process of, uh, you know, homing in on that final design that you're really excited about. So what am I going to build? I am going to build this, which is a very weird looking board. And there's a few things about this that I've been really interested in. So this is a mid-length board. It's an eight foot board. And my design criteria is that I want a board that is easier to paddle than a conventional, you know, short board, uh, which I have plenty of short boards, but I'm getting older, I'm getting a little lazy. And I'm finding that I really enjoy getting into a wave just a little bit earlier so I can get my feet set up and it, it just makes the entire experience a little bit easier for me. And I want to experiment with a board that is ideally longer um, so I can get that paddle speed, but also I want it to be relatively lively. I don't want a long board. I have a 10 foot long board. I, I ride that, but you know, long boards can be kind of boring sometimes. They don't, they can be really hard to turn um, and sometimes I want to go out in decent sized ways, but I don't really want to have the classic long board experience. I want something that's a little bit more lively. So the theory that goes into this design is I wanted a board that had um, all of the, the center of efforts, this, the center of gravity, the, the, um, the Y point shifted aft on the board. And to do that, you have to do a lot, you may basically make a really weird shape. Um, and so let me illustrate sort of what that means. So the, the nose of this board is actually on the right hand side. You might have thought that that was the tail, but it's not. The nose is on the right, the tail is on the back. And the first thing I want to do is I want to distribute the, the width, the Y point of the board aft um, towards the tail. So here in red, um, that represents the widest point of the board where a lot of times the widest point of the board might be in the actual geometric center, and oftentimes the widest point of the board is up forward um, of where you put your chest when you're actually paddling. Um, the downside about having the wide point forward is it moves the center of gravity forward, and then the center of gravity is sitting farther forward of where you actually stand. So the theory of this board, and they call these wide point aft boards, and, and this is by no means my concept. These have been around for a very long time in both long boards and mid shapes. Um, having the wide point aft and the center of gravity aft underneath the stance of the rider 
um, reduces the momentum swing weight of the nose and makes the board in theory more lively to turn. At least that is the that is what I've heard about them. I've never actually ridden one and I've had a hard time finding one. Um, so that's really what's been motivating me to, to, to do this project. Um, if we look at the at the side profile of the rocker, um, you can start to see this board really is sort of like a one big math equation. So before in that previous slide, you had the star where the center of gravity is. This is also going to be where the apex of the rocker line hits its low point. Um, so it's sort of the, the game of shaping this board and, and where the software can be really helpful is getting the apex of the rocker line, the center of gravity, and or the center of mass, and the, the wide point of the board all to hit at the same point. And I'm really excited to see what this does. Um, in theory, what it should do is make the board feel very pivoty underneath um, the rider uh, and make a board that's long, it's eight feet long, but it should make it turn and be more responsive uh, almost as a board that's substantially shorter than this. At least that is the hope. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the outline, um, the rocker, the thickness. Now let's talk a little bit about the rails and the contours. So if we look at the nose, the red line on the right represents which cross section we're looking at here. And when you get into the software, you'll see all the softwares um, allow you to kind of look at the boards this way. Um, I have one, two, three, four, five cross sections that I'm defining. One in the, four, in the front where it says flat right here, one in the middle, and then two in the back. And these are the places where I'm defining the rails and the contours. So up forward, uh, my contour is flat. You can see the, the, the board is just flat up front, and that's going to help um, when, you're, when you're paddling the board and the board's trying to initiate planing up on the front when your weight's forward on the chest. A flat board is going to initiate planing really easily and help you build up speed. At least that's the hope. Um, my rails here are very round, so I, I want them to be round and forgiving so I don't have any edge catching. I want the board to be easy to ride um, and not too challenging because, you know, I'm an intermediate surfer at best. Uh, now if we go back to the center of the board, we're going to maintain that flat contour. The, bo the board is still flat back here. Um, but we're starting to round in the the uh, the rails a very slight bit. So there's a little bit of an asymmetry, um, a little bit of downward tucking in the rail, but not much. Then we move back to the next station, um, all the way back to where the uh, where the fin box is. This is right in in front of the fin box. We've transitioned from a flat board to a double concave. And the double concave, in theory, is supposed to give you some punch, some speed, um, give the board a little bit more of a livelihood uh, feel. And what's important to understand is from the previous slide, if we go from here to here, we're gonna have a interpolation. The, com the computer's gonna interpolate the change from being, um, from being flat up in the mid section to the double concave. So that double concave is going to build in from the midpoint of the board into the back. And our rail is going to go from that kind of you know slightly tucked and rounded um, to a little bit more round, a little bit more tucked um, as it gets to the back. And then if we move all the way to the tail off the back of the board, we're going to have transition to a V, which is just a, uh, a low point in the middle of the board. Um, with sharp rails. So we're going to transition. If we go back one, we have those rounded rails with a double concave, and then it's going to evolve into sharp rails um, with a V. And I would say for me, the, the rails and the bottom concave are the, are the elements of the design that I'm least experienced on. And so I'm really, um, I'm trying not to be too extreme, and I'm just kind of getting these ideas based on other boards that I know that work. Um, but I'm really not trying to be too, uh, too innovative here. I'm just kind of using tried and true methodologies. All right, so this goes into step number nine, which is you, after you've done all your work and you've designed your board uh, on, on the software, you're happy with how it looks, it's time to find a CNC machine. And the best way I find to do that is just to Google um, CNC surfboard um, in your geographical area, or you can also just look for local shapers. 
and find their websites and see if they shape with a CNC. And then it's just a matter of getting on the phone, calling shapers, calling the different people that have them, and see if they offer that as a service um, for you to provide them a shape and if they will cut it for you. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'm going to start Googling all around the state of Florida and see if I can find a shaper uh, that will cut this board for me. Did we find someone to cut the phone? We did! Total success. Um, it took a couple weeks since we shot that last video of us, uh, you know, just working on the computer um, to find someone to source the surfboard blank and cut it on their CNC machine, but it was pretty pain free. Uh, the process I used, I just got on the Google, typed in my geographic area, looked up local surfboard manufacturers, and then I just shot him an email, gave him a phone call, and told them what my project was that, you know, I already had a board I designed on the CAD software, and then I was looking for someone that could help me source a blank and, and have it cut in their machine. Probably reached out to about 10 different different companies, and uh, I had a bunch of them that were able to do the work, and then I just shopped around for price. Um, a couple of the shapers didn't want to cut something that wasn't their own design, which is totally understandable, so you might run into that as well. Um, but overall, everyone was super positive, helpful, um, provided some feedback ideas. A lot of them thought the design was pretty wacky, which was cool, it was fun to hear that. And, um, but yeah, it, it, it was super easy to do and all in all it cost me $200 per board. I, I'm designing two. I decided to go with an eight foot and then a scale down seven six because um, I'm not really sure which size would be better and I'm kind of curious to try both. And I figured if we're gonna go to the trouble of, of doing all this work, you might as well just make two. Um, so yeah, two boards shaped 200 bucks a pot for foam and cutting super easy super fast and now the boards are here and ready to be prepped for fiberglass when you get your board from the cnc it's going to look pretty close to done um, but depending on how um, detailed they take the cuts you're going to still see some lines here so if you see these little ridges these are lines from the actual cnc machine um, and oftentimes they will depending on how much time they want to put it in the machine They'll either be more rough cut or more smooth. Um, this is sort of in between, um, but we definitely want to uh, get rid of these. We're going to want to get rid of these before we do glassing. We also have a couple, a couple little notches here, a couple little dents, and, and the guy was super apologetic for that. And I said it was all good, no problem. We can we can work with that. Um, um, but yeah, so in general, this is the board is pretty close to being ready, but you have just little things here. Um, just little imperfections and grooves that we're going to want to clean first. Here is the nose of the board. A little bit closer up view, you can see those kind of groove marks from the CNC machine. And if we go back, you can see how they kind of run length, lengthwise around the board. You can also see our rails still have some shaping to do. Um, they got pretty close, um, but we definitely need to, to clean those out and just, you know, just round that rail. Um, so this is where you can go back and look at your original um, CAD design and just make sure, um, you know, kind of a little bit of a hard edge. I think he did an okay job. I feel like he could have done maybe a little bit of a better job on the rails, but um, overall I'm happy. Um, this is always really exciting because you can actually see the final design. You can see as we look back here, you can kind of see the concaves emerging flat. You'll see that double concave. There's that double concave emerging in the back and then to that V. Um, so it's really cool to see the final concept from the computer in real life. Um, it's, a, it's a very exciting and satisfying part of the build. To get these CNC groove marks out of the board, we're going to use a pretty big foam block with 80 grit sandpaper. So this is just a simple Velcro foam block um, with the sandpaper on one side. And the nice thing about a foam block is you can kind of bend it a little bit. So I'm bending it to sort of follow the the domeness of the deck. Um, and then I'm just gonna have an extra little piece here to use by hand um, to do the rails because it can be a little tricky to use a uh, foam block for the rails. And what I'm gonna do is just take really big, big um, sweeping motions and just going back and forth just like that and working these grooves down. I wanna make sure I don't over sand. You know, the board has its shape from, from the CNC wet, like perfectly right now. Um, so we really don't want to start overly doing. We're just trying to get those grooves out um, and make the board smooth. For things like this, we don't want to sand that out. We're going to deal with that with the little filler in a moment, things like that. 
Um, so don't, you know, don't sand that off. Again, we're just trying to get the grooves out. And uh, so I'm gonna knock that out really quick. Finished sanding, board looks nice and smooth. And again, what we were going for is just to get all those CNC grooves off the board, smoothen out the rails and just get the shape nice and smooth. Uh, the next step we're gonna do is something I've never done before um, and it's called sealing the board. And the idea, the theory behind this is that when you fiberglass over um, foam like this, the, the resin can seep a little bit too much into the foam and it can result in a board that's a little bit heavy. And so one strategy to address this is to use like drywall spackle. And the spackle that I've found that people seem to really like um, is just basic um, fast and final lightweight spackle. And it's, it's by DAP, you can get this at Home Depot. This whole bucket um, was a couple of bucks. It's really light. You wanna make sure you get the, the uh, low density spackle. And they, the one guy said on the form, way you can tell is when you go and lift this up, you should be surprised how light it is. You should almost feel like it's half empty. And what the spackle is gonna do, we're gonna spackle the entire board and then sand it back. And the reason we're gonna do that is it's going to fill in all the little nooks and crannies in the foam. Um, when this foam is made, it's actually just kind of held together. Um, and there's, there's like porosity, there's like openings between the foam beads. And you can have too much resin seep in uh, when you have that kind of porosity. So I've never done this before. Um, it, it sounded interesting. I always like to try new things, um, but hopefully what it's going to accomplish is um, it's gonna make the board have a really smooth, nice finish. Um, it's gonna fill in all of those little voids and, and that por porosity um, with the very low density um, filler. And then when we finally do glass the board, the final board should be quite a bit lighter um, without being any weaker. So that's, that's what we're gonna do now. Time to, to break out the, uh, the spackling equipment and uh, get this going. This is a good section of the board to kind of illustrate what we're trying to do. You can see this, these little pores in the foam, even though we sanded it, we still have these. So now we're gonna come through and just spackle this on. And you, you, you wanna get as little in as possible. You don't want to like goober this stuff on too much. So what we found is working is you start with kind of a lot, like you kind of just get the coverage and then come back through with the hard edge and just really try to take all the excess off. And then if you've done your job right at the end, it'll be really smooth and all those holes that we saw at the beginning will be gone. So see how that's way smoother now? Look at that. Beautiful. notice is that trying to use the flat edge on the rails is kind of hard and Fiona discovered it's pretty easy to use your finger with a glove so she's just doing that and working those uh, those lines out and removing any excess and it actually works surprisingly well here's the other side of the board that she already did so you can see you can get a nice smooth result by just using your finger and just clearing that off. And then on the flat sections, using the flat edge works really well. One more note with this fast and final um, spackling putty. Uh, I saw a lot of people saying it's really good to uh, water this down a little bit with distilled water. Um, and you wanna use distilled water to prevent it from yellowing. Um, I didn't have any distilled water and I felt like the consistency um, was soft enough that we could get it on. 
so we just went ahead and did it without and it honestly it seems to be working fine um, but a lot of people on the forum say adding a little bit of distilled water and getting it to sort of like a almost Elmer's glue consistency can make the process even easier. The fast and final spackle has dried and now it's time to sand this down to a super smooth finish and for that I've got uh, my trusty sanding block with this time I'm using 120 grit uh, sandpaper. I don't need quite as much grit to, to get down through the spackle. And then for the rails, I'm using just a just a piece of sandpaper just cur curved around like this to help me um, really just clean the rails up really nicely. And we want to be careful when we're doing this. We don't want to just remove everything. We want to be kind of strategic. And to illustrate, I've made a hopefully clear but probably terrible diagram. Um, if you look before, kind of what the, the foam, if you were to think about the foam surface, it's sort of like these beads are sort of like circles um, at the top, and you've got that little space between each um, bead head. And what we're trying to do is fill those bead heads with the spackle and then sand it flush. So when we're, we're done, hopefully we'll have a pretty flat surface um, where we've kind of chopped the, the, the tops off of those foam beads and we filled that little interstitial space between the two with spackle and have a nice flat surface. So this is sort of visually what we're going for. Um, we want to make sure we're not just sanding all the spackle off. We want to sand down to a little bit of the foam, just a tiny bit, and then leaving that nice flat surface um, so we're really um, set up for success when we lay down glass. So I'm going to get to it. Time to sand one more. Already did the 7.6, came out great, going nice and fast, super easy. Okay, we've got the board ready to go. The, the blank is all sealed up, shaped. It's time to do some fiberglass work. And for that, we're gonna be using um, CLR Clear Laminating Epoxy by Entropy Resins. And I really love this company. I love the product. Um, it's a really cool company. They, they actually do a lot of environmental um, consideration when manufacturing. Uh, this resin and they use um, the highest bio-based resin co uh, content I've been able to find on the market and despite that the product works really well. Um, it has really good pot life, um, comes out really really nice. Um, I find that the epoxy doesn't yellow that much. I've been using it for a couple years and I discovered these guys from when we built that wooden surfboard back in Maine a few years ago um, at Grain Surfboards. They use Entropy and they got me down the rabbit hole of Entropy Resins, and uh, I really, really like it. So um, for this project, we'll be using their CLR um, Clear Laminating Epoxy Resin with their Slow Hardener. And you can get different formulations of the hardener. Some can be a faster curing, some can be slower, but I really like the Slow Hardener, especially for the hot temperatures we have here in, in Miami. And it just gives us a little bit more of a working life. I also find this, uh, this resin works really nice. It has some UV inhibit inhibitors in it. And uh, sometimes epoxies can yellow and crack and degrade over time. But um, I find it on projects I've done a few years ago, they're still holding up really well despite being out in the uh, Florida sun all the time. So can't recommend these guys enough. I really love this resin. And uh, now it's time to do some glass work. Before we dive into the actual lamination, let's talk about fiberglass really fast. So this is just a little piece of fiberglass. And what fiberglass is, is basically like cloth where the fibers, instead of say cotton or polyester that you're used to in clothing, um, the fibers are actually made of extruded glass. And so it's fiberglass, literally what the word means. And this cloth, when you lay it down and you use resin to bond it um, really tightly to a foam surface, you create what's called a composite sandwich, and it, it creates a really, really strong material. Um, so basically what we're gonna be doing is putting a little bit of fiberglass down on the top and the bottom of the board, and then carefully putting our epoxy into it, and then letting it, letting it dry, and we're gonna get a bond to the foam, so a foam, resin, and fiberglass. And depending on how many layers we do, uh, the board will get incredibly strong. We have to be careful if we put too many layers, the board can get heavy. Um, so there's definitely best practices on what to do with your surfboard. So for a board like this, a mid-length board, uh, typically what people do is they will put a um, two layers on the deck, usually like a six ounce layer and a four ounce layer. And what I mean when I say ounces, that's the ounces of material per, per square yard is the convention. Um, so this is, uh, I believe, six ounce cloth we have here. We also have some four ounce cloth. I'll show you in a minute what it looks like. 
Um, but typically when you're, when you're talking about a surfboard um, fiberglass job, they talk about the, what's, they use a term called the lamination schedule, which is sort of a weird word. Um, but the schedule basically means how many layers are you doing and what weights are the layers. So typically you'll do for a long board or, or board like this, maybe six and four ounces on the deck, um, sometimes maybe six and six ounces, so 12 ounces total or 10 ounces total on the deck and then a single layer of six ounce on the bottom. And that seems to be pretty common for boards of the size. For short boards, you might do a little bit less, um, maybe four, four um, with four on the bottom. It really depends, but the, the take home message is if you, the more fiberglass you put on, the stronger the board will be, the less pressure dense, the less cracking, um, but also the heavier it is. So if you're a professional surfer like Kelly Slater and you need some really um, high performance board and you don't mind if it breaks you'll put a really light fiberglass job whereas if you want a board that lasts a really long time you'll put more so for this board i think i'm going to do either six and four ounces on the deck i'm not totally sure i might do six 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 four i haven't decided yet and then six ounces on the bottom but we're going to start on the bottom you always start with the bottom first and the reason we do that is because we're going to do one layer on the bottom and that layer is going to come up off the bottom and wrap around the top. Um, so the first job I have to do is mark where that's going to be. To do that, I've created a little tool, a little PVC pipe tool with a little bit of uh, a pen and some tape. I mean, it looks horrible. Um, but basically what we're doing here is I'm going to put this on the rail and I'm going to draw a line. So you can just kind of see like this. I'm just going to carefully draw a line. You can barely see that, but there's a line right there. And that's going to mark, it's going to trace the perimeter. And this is about maybe one and a half to two inches in. It's going to trace um, a line all the way around the board. And that's going to show me where I want to put my tape. And, and it'll make more sense in a second, but first let me, let me draw the line and then I'll show you what we're doing with the tape. Okay, our line is drawn and you might be asking, why are we drawing a line on the deck of the board? And the reason is we want to mark where we want our fiberglass to end. And what I mean by that is when we're doing the underside of the board, we're going to have fiberglass. We're going to flip the board over. We're going to lay the glass on with the bottom of the board facing up. And the fiberglass, we want it to wrap around the rail. And this area of overlap um, is off, often referred to as a lap. And so there's different ways to do it, but one of the common ways, and I, one way I really like how it turns out, is to wrap the fiberglass all the way around the rail to a certain point. Now you could just like do it at any point and just like smear it over here, but you're gonna, it's gonna look really messy. So if we draw these lines, what we can do is we can take painter's tape and we can tape off all of this area here that we don't want the fiberglass to go to. And so then when we wrap the fiberglass around and it gets to the tape, we're gonna have a very clean line that we can cut it from. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna leave the board looking really clean and ready for us to do the deck. So we'll, we're gonna do the bottom first. That single layer of six ounce cloth is gonna to come to here. We're gonna cut it at this line. We're gonna put tape here so that no fiberglass gets into the foam. Then when we're doing the top side of the board, we're gonna lay glass over here and do the exact reverse op, the, procedure where the deck fiberglass is going to wrap underneath and that's going to give us these areas on the rails where we're going to have extra glass so say we do a six and four ounce um, glass job on the on the deck with six ounce on the bottom that means in this region here where there's overlap we're going to have two layers of six and a layer of ten of four and that's going to give us really really strong um, rails which is going to prevent dinging you know usually when a board gets hit it gets hit on the rails you drop it, it gets, you know, dinged in travel, that kind of thing. So having really strong rails is, is really great. Um, and so we've got our, our lines here. Now it's time to get some tape out to just tape off everywhere we don't want any resin or fiberglass to go. So what I'm going for here, my first bit of tape, I'm gonna put just inside my lap line. So you can see with a pencil line right there, I'm going just a little bit inside towards the stringer and I'm using just basic blue painter's tape. I find that works really well. You can use fancier tape, apparently it's better, but uh, I haven't had any problems with this blue tape. Um, and what I'm doing, I'm gonna go inside the line on my first piece, and then on my second piece, just to sort of illustrate, I have a little piece here, I'm gonna take my second piece and I'm gonna overlap that and I'm gonna go right on the line like that. 
And the reason I'm doing that is that when resin is coming up, um, when I'm wrapping that glass, I want it to have like a step down. I want the first piece to be over the second piece as opposed to the other way around. So I don't know if it makes a big difference, but I've seen it done that way and it makes sense to me. So I'm gonna do that first layer just inside and then the second layer over, directly over very carefully the pencil lap lines we drew. And I'm gonna fill the entire board up with, with, uh, with tape. You can use um, paper or some people use like painter's plastic, um, but I find that using the tape is just, it's the most safest way to do it. You get just a really good finish from it. So it's, it uses a lot of tape, but overall it gives a great result. Tape is on, and I just wanna illustrate why we're going to all of this trouble. Cause you know, it takes a fair amount of time and it's a fair amount of tape. Um, got a piece of scrap fiberglass here. When we are fiberglassing the underside of the board, this is the deck side, um, we're gonna have some of that fiberglass is gonna come up over the edge. So if you can kind of imagine, this is gonna be under here, and we're gonna have a little bit of it wrapping up onto here. And what the tape does is it prevents any of this glass from sticking to the board. And we want that because once it's all you know bonded and all the epoxy is cured, we wanna have a nice clean cut line um, where this layer of fiberglass ends. So now we're gonna flip the board over and we're gonna actually lay the fiberglass out and cut it and prep it. And what we're going for, and it'll be easier to see this now before we flip it, is when we wanna have a little bit of overlap, right? When, if, when the board is um, flipped over and this fiberglass is coming over the rail, we want just a little bit coming onto the tape and we don't want any additional more than that. So we're gonna, cut it and I'll show you when we're cutting it, um, but it's a little easier to see here. Uh, you might be asking yourself, couldn't you have just put tape like to here? Did you have to go all the way across? And you can, you can get away with just doing a strip of tape here to protect uh, the foam. But I find that when you're doing this glass job, um, when you're trying to get this fiberglass to stick underneath, um, it's easy to kind of like over squeegee and like smear resin up here. and. I like to put tape across the whole deck just to be careful, um, just because it, it preserves the foam, make sure we don't have an accident. Um, because if we accidentally smeared resin and some fiberglass bits and we, we didn't have any tape here, it would get into the foam and it could really create a lot of work for us. So it's a little bit of extra work to do this tape on the front end, but I think in the long term, it will save you time. But let's flip the board and prep the fiberglass. Here is our fiberglass roll. We flip the board over so the bottom side of the board is facing up and we've got the tape side underneath. And we've got six ounce uh, fiberglass that we got from Jamestown Distributors, which is one of my favorite places to get um, building supplies whenever I'm doing board work or boat work. They're just a fantastic company with amazing customer service. And uh, you can get fiberglass in a lot of different places, but I really like getting it from Jamestown just because their customer service is so amazing. And if I ever have any questions, um, they're always super easy, um, fast, they're super knowledgeable. So check them out, Jamestown Distributors. Um, we've got our roll here of six ounce, and we're gonna lay this out across the board and prepare it for cutting. The six ounce cloth is on, looks beautiful, always a very exciting and rewarding step. And now we're on to what I think is maybe the most important step of the glassing process, at least for me. And that is cutting the excess fiberglass off. And we'll go underneath to kind of see why this is so important. Now, if we didn't cut this off, see how we have a bunch of extra fiberglass? If we didn't cut this off, the resin is gonna drip down onto here and kind of partially saturate this cloth. And then we're gonna fold it in and we're gonna take it into our tape line here. Now, if we leave too much of this on, it's gonna be really hard to saturate all of this with resin. It's gonna kind of drip and some of it's gonna be dry and some of it's gonna be wet. And when we try to wrap this underneath, all of this weight, gravity is gonna be pulling this whole thing down and it's gonna be really easy for this to just fall. And if it falls off our tape, it's gonna create a disaster. So it is incredibly important so important to cut this. You wanna cut it at just enough fiberglass so it can make it past your tape line, but mo no more than that. You wanna take it just to about where my finger is there and have it cut. And that's a little tricky to do because the board has curvature. You have to go around and really carefully cut it. And that's what I'm gonna do now. But 
it's really important. I, I, I definitely have had times with boards and really messed up my glass job where I got a little lazy, I left too much glass, and then the resin didn't saturate the lap. And then as I pulled it in here, it didn't all stick, and then it started to fall out and just ended up with a really sloppy glass job. So super important, be very patient, get your scissors, cut around the perimeter, and very carefully measure it. Make sure you're getting just up to that tape line, a little bit beyond it, and it's gonna save you a lot of time in the long run. We've got our six ounce fiberglass cut, and you'll see what we're doing. I cut it, and so now it'll just reach the tape, but no more, just a little bit past the tape. And I've gone all around the board and cut it right up to the tape line, so we're getting a nice overlap. The other thing I've done is cut little patterns in the high curvature areas of the board. If you don't do this, it'll be really hard to wrap the cloth. When you have a curvature in the board, the, co the cloth will have a tendency to kink. And you kind of see, you'll go underneath, see what, what we're talking about. When this is all wet and we're trying to wrap it under the board, by cutting the first one, you cut straight into the center line of the board and give it a little bit of a taper. And we're gonna be able to pull this underneath and then pull this piece underneath and then pull that piece underneath. And so these, these patterns, every board, um, depending on the shape of the board, you can use different patterns. Um, some will require less than others. Uh, long boards that have less curvature will require less of these cuts, but I did one down the middle with a little bit of a curvature. And then I had to do two more um, just to get um, this glass to lay up without it kinking. And you'll see what we're going for once the resin's on, uh, to make more sense. Uh, and the same thing back here on the tail, one line straight into the center with a little bit of curvature, and then one straight in to the side. We should be able to, when this is all wet, we should be able to fold this up nice and neat without any, uh, without any kinks. And we're also going to add a thin box patch, and that's just a little piece of extra fiberglass that goes just over the thin box. So we're at the tail of the board, and this is gonna be a single fin board, so the fin box is gonna go from about here to here. I could also add some bite side fins that would go kind of around here. And I just wanna add a little bit of glass just to give this area a little extra oomph. You know, when you're riding on the waves, that fin gets really loaded up, and having a little bit extra strength here can be beneficial. So this is a piece of four ounce glass, and I've cut it, and what we're doing differently than the six ounce, instead of having the fiberglass wrap the whole rail, we're gonna cut this right at the rail. So it's just, we're just cutting it right at the rail all the way around, and then we're cutting a nice little V pattern in here. And this helps, you know, they say, instead of having like a straight line, if you have a straight line going across, that creates sort of an area of weakness. This is sort of like a taper, it kind of distributes the load. And uh, so we've got this all set up, and now I'm just gonna bring my, my six ounce back over the top carefully. And we'll have, we're gonna lay these one on top of each other and we'll do it all at once. So we've got our six ounce and we've got our four ounce patch underneath and we're now ready for resin. It's time to get our epoxy ready. I have the resin already in our bin here. I haven't put the hardener in because I'm going to add tint. We're gonna add some color to this board using epoxy tint. You can use any tint that is suitable for epoxy. And the way that you do it is follow the instructions for whatever tint that you're using. Usually they'll have like a mass amount. So we're gonna use 30 ounces of resin and harder. So there's 20 ounces of resin here. And we're gonna add 10 ounces of hardener in a second. But before that, I'm going to take my scale and I'm gonna get this tint in it. So we're gonna go here, zero the scale. And then we're going to come in and it calls for 17, for 30 ounces of resin, it calls for 17 grams of this color. It's a really fun green. There we go, 17 grams, ready to rock. Before I put the hardener in, I'm just going to mix my tint up a little bit just to kind of get it going. Oh, it's a super cool color. I love it. That's great. We have 20 ounces of resin, and now we have 10 ounces of hardener. We're gonna add a two to one ratio. And I'm gonna pour this in, and we are gonna mix this up 
for at least probably five minutes or so. Um, and, and whatever resin, if you decide not to use Entropy, if you use a different resin, just make sure you pay attention to the instructions on the resin and uh, do however much they recommend mixing, follow those instructions closely. I find that people do tend to under mix their epoxy. Here we go putting the resin on the board and this work goes pretty fast and it, it, it definitely can be beneficial to have a partner helping you. So I've got Fiona here helping me out. And the first thing we're gonna do is pour a little bit of the resin onto the board, just on the, on the center of the board, um, and to just kind of wet that out pretty quickly and get um, the majority of the fiberglass on the flat section um, somewhat saturated, um, just so it starts to seep in and bond with the foam. Um, we only wanna use maybe, say, 25%, 20% of the resin in our bucket um, in that initial pour, um, because we wanna make sure we're saving uh, the other resin for the next steps. Uh, the second step is focusing on pouring the resin onto the rails and using the squeegee to draw the resin around the rails onto the fabric that is hanging vertically off the side. And this is the most important part because if you don't get the fiberglass that's laying vertically off the side um, saturated, it's gonna be really hard to get it to wrap underneath the board. So you'll see I'm kind of going around with my squeegee, so is Fiona, um, just using our hands, making sure that the uh, fiberglass that's hanging down is getting properly saturated. And once it is, um, we use our squeegee to, to um, press it underneath and get it to bond on that underside of the board. Once we've completed that, we'll take the remaining resin and pour it out on the, on the top of the board and then carefully squeegee it um, around making sure all the glass is saturated and then removing any excess resin. We don't want the board to be um, too heavy um, and adding excess resin doesn't make the board any stronger, just makes it heavier. Um, so that's sort of our final step is uh, going around and carefully removing any excess resin. And so that's it. Those are the kind of the three steps, um, you know, definitely planning ahead and working quickly and having a buddy help you um, can really set you up for success. It's the next day and the resin has cured really well. It's nice and hard and it, man, it came out really good. We got pretty good uniform color in the pigment and uh, let's flip the board over to look at what the deck looks like. Here's the deck and if our previous steps where we put the tape on weren't clear on why we did that, hopefully it's clear now. So this is the tape we put on. Here's our tape line and we wrapped our fiberglass beyond the tape line and really looking, really want this section to be very, very clean. And we don't really care about this section. So you can see here, like we have some kinking and stuff, but this doesn't matter because we're gonna cut this off. What really matters is, is that this part of the lap is really clean. And if I go around the perimeter of the board, I see we got really clean lap. Everything looks really good. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a razor blade and very carefully go and just scour right on this edge, just really carefully, just kind of making a very um, shallow um, a shallow cut. I don't want to cut into the foam. I just want to help the fiberglass crack at that point. I'm going to go around the perimeter of the board, and then we'll start removing the tape and removing the uh, excess fiberglass. Got the tape off, and now we have a nice clean line of fiberglass and foam. And so now we have two steps before we can lay glass on the deck. Step number one is we're gonna get our sanding block and we're just gonna clean up. There's some, you always get a little bit of like bumpage and sort of um, just some sloppiness when you have the laps um, go over at the front and back of the board. So we just wanna sand these down so they're nice and flat because we're gonna lay, lay glass over them. I'm also gonna just very lightly sand the edge of the fiberglass to make sure there's no ridge. I want it to be perfectly flat because we're laying glass over this. And then again, up here, we're gonna just um, sand that nice and nice and uh, flat with um, a foam block or maybe even a uh, disc sander if we need to. Once we do that, then it is time to flip the board, which I'll go ahead and do right now. And then we're just gonna reverse the same process we used on the underside. I'm gonna use my trusty tool, gonna draw a perimeter line, 
I'm gonna tape off the interior of the board and it's gonna be the same process except this time on the deck, we're gonna have fiberglass coming over here and uh, we'll have a little bit of overlap there. So it's ex the exact same procedure as what we just did, just reversing it and doing it on the deck. The bottom tape job is done. So same deal as before, we're now prepared to lay glass on the deck and we're gonna wrap that fiberglass around just past the tape line and then we'll be able to cut it nice and clean and have a beautiful looking transition between the extra layers of glass and the single layer of glass. So let's flip it over and get to glassing. After much deliberation, I've decided to go with a six and four ounce layup schedule for the deck of this board. So we're gonna first put on a layer of four ounce cloth and then a second layer of six. And the reason I'm doing the four ounce first, and there's different reasons to do it different ways. Some people uh, advocate for putting the thinner layer of glass on second, with the reason being that when you put the resin on it, it has um, kind of, you can think of the weave as being sort of shallower. And when it comes to doing your kind of gloss coat filler layer of resin after, it's gonna require less resin to make the final finish nice and smooth and the board will, will be lighter. And that totally makes sense. However, if I were to do my four ounce layer second, the second layer is the layer that actually wraps all the way around, whereas this first layer, we're gonna cut right to the rail. And that means I'm gonna have less fiberglass on my rails and the board is gonna be slightly weaker in the rails. And since I'm already going for kind of a lighter um, layup for with the four ounce, I thought it's probably best to stick with the, uh, with the six ounce wrapping all the around the rail. So what I'm gonna do right now is cut, um, instead of having this layer cut all the way around and wrap to the other underside, we're gonna cut it right at the rail um, as the first layer. And then the second layer, which will be our six ounce glass, is gonna go all the way around just like we did on the other side. So let me get this cut up real quick and then we'll get the six ounce on. Four ounces on and this is just looking at how we're cutting it. We're not bringing it all the way around, just bringing it down about halfway down the rail. Um, so much easier to cut. And now we're gonna put the six ounce on and cut it to get all the way around to reach the tape on the underside. Six ounce glass is on and we've got the fiberglass cut just as before, just long enough so we can make it to the tape and a little bit beyond. And uh, that top layer of glass is gonna roll over and hold that, that four ounce layer underneath. And uh, it should come out, come out real nice, but now it's time to mix up a big batch of resin, lay this puppy up. deck layer of glass has cured and I think this thing looks like an avocado and I love it. Glass job looks great. Let's flip it over and take a look at the bottom. Underside of the board looks really good. We got clean wraps all the way around. No kinking. Um, got a little close here. That's about as far as you want to push it in terms of getting close to the tape line but um, everything looks good, so I'm going to start pulling the tape off and then we will cut the tape line just like we did on the underside of the board and remove this extra glass. We've got the underside of the board all cleaned up, got all of the tape off and gave it just a little bit of a sanding just to make this edge a little bit smoother for the next step, um, but not too much, really focusing mostly on the tail, um, just getting that smooth and up at the nose, those are the areas where you tend to get the most um, kind of accumulation of fiberglass. So we just wanted to take down any big excess there. Um, but now it's time to move on to the next step, which is filler coat. And we're gonna do the top side of the board first. All right, we've got the board deck side up. And now it's time to do what's called a filler coat. So when we did our fiberglass job prior, we were really careful to make, make sure we use the squeegee to pull any excess resin out of the glass. And the reason we do that, we want the board to be light and excess resin in fiberglass really doesn't make the board any stronger. Um, you wanna have just enough resin to saturate the cloth, but no more than that. 
that'll leave the board with almost like a, a rough texture. If I, if I drag my nails across the board, you know, you can see all the texture. You can see the weave of the fiberglass. And if we want to work on this and really give the board a nice glossy finish, we have to put a very thin coat of resin over this that'll allow us to, to work with it. If, if I were to take sandpaper to this board right now, we might accidentally sand through the fiberglass. And if we did that, the board is gonna be weak, it'll expose the foam and we'll have all sorts of problems. So before we do that, we wanna put on a, a, a single coat of resin that's just gonna fill in all of the weave, fill in all the little imperfections and leave us with a nice gloss coat that we can work with and then and then sand down and polish for the final step. And we were real close. This board isn't really gonna get any structurally stronger than it is right now. A lot of what we're doing now is just aesthetics um, and just giving it that extra perfect look. So what we're gonna do now is take a simple paintbrush, just a throwaway paintbrush, and we're gonna mix a smaller batch because this resin is not gonna be seeping into the cloth, so we don't need nearly as much. Um, I'm gonna put some pigment in it just to keep pulling that green out, making the board like super green because I think it looks rad. And what I'm gonna do is just mix up the resin and we're gonna just carefully distribute it across the board and give it a nice glossy finish. Um, the only difference with this step in terms of um, taping um, is where we place the tape and how we set up the tape lines. And I'm gonna show you that now. All right, I've got a little piece of tape to illustrate how we're gonna tape the deck off for our filler coat. And what we did before, we had tape underneath the board. This time we're gonna have tape on the rail, about halfway down the rail, maybe three quarters of the way down. And what we're putting the tape here for is to prevent um, accumulation of resin from wrapping underneath and causing bumps on the underside of the board. You kind of think about like if the resin is just sort of flowing off, it'll make little drips. It'll kind of like drip, 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 and it'll create like a little mountain where that drip is forming and eventually that resin is gonna cure and the, dri and the drip is gonna, you know, just seize in place and you're gonna have a big bump. And you're gonna have to sand the entire board and there's a good chance it's gonna look pretty bad. So to prevent this, what we can do is put a little bit of tape right here. So as the resin flows off the board, it'll hit the tape and then just fall straight down onto the floor. And uh, one trick that can really help make this effective is by taking a little piece of cardboard. So I have a little piece of cardboard here, folding it in half, and then using it as a standoff to hold the tape off. So I'm gonna take it here and I'm gonna just kind of stuff it underneath the tape and it's gonna hold the tape off. So if I go underneath, you see that piece of cardboard? And it does a really good job of holding the tape off, especially when you're coming around a curve, the tape's gonna have a tendency to wanna to like fold in. And if it folds in, it's not gonna do its job. The resin's gonna get around, it's gonna get on the underside of the board, we're gonna have all sorts of problems. But if we have these little, these cardboard standoffs, it'll hold it off. And this is a trick I learned from the guys up at Grain in, uh, in York, Maine, and it's so awesome. It works really, really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and tape off the entire perimeter of the board and put these little cardboard standoffs every six inches or so. And just to highlight what our tape is doing, look at those drips falling straight down and leaving us a nice, clean line. Board looks sweet. You can see that, that gloss coat really makes it shine and look real pretty. So we're gonna let this cure overnight and pull the tape off, do the other side. Filler coat is on and oh, the board feels so smooth. Very fulfilling step. Um, and this board is ready for hardware, but before we get into that, we're gonna show you 
the blue board because we did both these boards in parallel. I actually did the blue board first um, so that I could learn a little bit before I shot the video to give some tips on the process. Um, and that's the 7.6. So let me take that down off the racks and show it to you. Here's the blue 7.6 in all of its glory. I really like, we had a little bit less um, pigment left over. I didn't do as good a job distributing my pigment. So, but it actually created this color shift that I actually really like. So um, it all worked out well. Um, a little bit of darkening up here with the overlap, but overall I think it came out really good. You can see that darker blue where we have that thin patch in the back. So yeah, pretty amped about how they both came out. There's the uh, seven six, the blue. We got the eight foot, the yellow or green, I guess. And the reason again, I, I made two boards was I have no idea how these things are gonna surf. These are prototype experiment boards. Part of me thinks that a smaller 7.6 is gonna be a better design for this, for the ways we have here in South Florida. But then, I don't know, maybe the 8.0 will be better. And that's what experimentation is all about, trying different things and seeing what works. But let's get into putting hardware in. And the first thing we're going to do is put in the leash plugs. Here we are at the tail and we have to decide where do we want to put the leash plug. Um, I'm going to put it as far back as I can. Uh, I don't want to step on it when I'm riding. Um, and I also, we have extra fiberglass here from our laps, which is going to give us some extra strength. So I'm going to put it right here. Um, it's good to, you want to line it straight in the center, over the center line, so you can grip into some of that uh, wood. Um, and you want to align it like this, I've learned, not like that. Uh, and the reason reasoning for this is that when this is getting pulled, if it's aligned like this, it'll be distributing the load on either side. Whereas if you align it like this, it'll tend to just pull, if the leash is pulling tension, the leash rope will pull to one side and you'll get a bias and it's more likely to pull out. At least that's what I have read on the forums. So we're gonna go for that. And first step is we're gonna put some tape down. Got the tape down and I used a marker just to trace where the stringer is on the tape. Um, and then that allows me to put the, uh, the circle where I want the leash plug directly over the stringer. Um, from here, you can do a couple things. If you have a hole saw, you can just cut a super fast and easy uh, um, hole here. You need to have a hole saw that is the right diameter. I actually don't have a hole saw. And uh, so I'm just gonna do this the old fashioned way. I'm just gonna use a drill bit. The big, biggest drill bit I have, do a starter hole, and then I'm gonna take a Dremel and just carefully um, drill this out. Should only take a second, no big deal. And then we'll be on to mixing up some resin. Got our hole drilled out and we've taken the leash plug and I've put tape over the top of it so no resin gets into the actual plug. And I've drawn a line across the tape where the bar is just so I know where to orient it. And what you can see, we put this in, it fits in just nice and perfectly. And we're gonna leave it just like that. And now what we're gonna do is mix up some epoxy with some thickener. We're gonna fill that up and then we're gonna place our leash plug right in there. It's also a nice trick to score up the surface of this plastic um, with a little bit of sandpaper or even with the Dremel. And that's just going to give the epoxy more of a surface area to bond to. Um, epoxy doesn't stick terribly well to plastic, so um, you can really help it out by just roughing this up. And we'll do the same thing on the fin boxes, um, but that'll just give you a stronger bond strength to the leash plug itself. We've got our resin here. We mixed in some microspheres, which are just these fine little filler particles. There's lots of different types you can use. Um, but what we're what we're going for is sort of like an Elmer's glue consistency. So if you can, you want it just kind of falling off off the spoon here. Um, you don't want to make it so thick that it won't run. Um, so just think of that like Elmer's glue consistency is sort of what you're going for. Let's see if I can do this with one hand. All we're going to do is just going to fill this hole about I don't know maybe halfway filled with Cavasil and epoxy. Make sure it doesn't make a mess. Excuse my poor camera work. All right, probably put a little more than we needed. And then what we're gonna do, better to put a little more than too few, too little, um, because you want it to kind of overflow. So I definitely put too much in, it's definitely gonna overflow, but you'll see what will happen. We have our leash plug here. I'm just gonna drop this guy in and it's going to overflow as I push it down into the hole. 
it'll overflow and start falling off, and that's why we have the tape there. Here we go, nice and flush. And then we'll let that just run off. I'll, I'm gonna clean that off before it cures and then uh, set it, leave it to dry and we'll be good to go. So that's it, super fast, easy. Um, you wanna make sure that you have resin filled up all the way and if anything, you can have the box be a little proud, sitting a little higher, because when we come through here with the sander, we're gonna make it perfectly flush. So if anything, you want this all a little bit high and then you can take some down. If it's too low, it's gonna be a bit of a problem. Got our leash plug here. I got the tape off and we're just gonna come in just to finish this off, take the orbital sander and sand that flush so it's in line with our fiberglass. So real quick job, get that taken care of. With the leash plug in, we only have one more piece of hardware to put into this board and that is the fin box. So for this board, we're gonna do a, a simple single fin um, in the center of the board. I decided not to put any side bites in. I might put those in down the road if I feel like I need it, but I think a single fin will be enough. Um, to put in a fin box, there are sort of two ways we can do it. One is we can put the fin box like down where we think it's gonna go and then trace with a marker um, sort of the outline of the fin box and then go in with the router and remove the material. That's pretty risky um, because the router can jump on you. It's harder to, it's hard to keep the angle exactly like pointed straight down. There's just, in the past when I've tried this, I've made mistakes and it, the, the hole that I, that I uh, router out just doesn't look very good. It's got gaps, problems, and that makes the board weaker and the fin box placement weaker. So I'm gonna go with option two, which I'm, I'm gonna make a jig. And a jig, all the jig is, I'm gonna get a, just a piece of, um, you know, scrap wood that I found around the house. And I'm going to trace the fin box opening into the wood. And I'm gonna very carefully remove that material with the router. And then once I've done that, I can take this and very, very carefully place it and tape it down, make sure it's center. We've got some double concave here, so it's gonna be harder for this. See how it kind of wobbles? We're gonna have to shim it, make sure it's perfectly, perfectly flat, perfectly aligned with the str stringer, tape it in place, and then I'm gonna use the opening in the wood to guide my cut with the router. And that's gonna make it a lot less prone to having a mistake um, when I put this in. You can buy um, pre-made jigs for all sorts of different fin boxes, single fins, um, FCS Future. Uh, they make them, you know, just Google on the internet, um, whatever fin you're putting in, you can Google just a fin box um, template um, or fin box router template and they make them, but it's also super easy to just make it yourself. When making your fin box template, the first step that's really important is to establish a center line. And this is gonna be the line that we use to align the template with the center line of the board. Um, the reason why this is so important is that, you know, the edges of this wood, the way it's cut, they may not be symmetrical. Um, so you can't really rely on, on edges to establish what is straight and what is not. So um, what I've done is I, I've marked the middle of the wood more or less. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close and drawn a straight line. And then what I'm going to do is place the fin box on the line. And there's some little notches here in the front to make sure those are aligned on either end, and then I can trace this out and router it. Then when we are putting this on the board, we can use these markings to make sure that the template is perfectly straight with the, uh, the stringer and center line of the board. Fin box tracing is complete, so pretty simple job, just carefully tracing the outline of the fin box and making sure that it is aligned symmetrically on the center line of our jig. Now I'm just gonna take a half inch uh, router bit and carefully remove this material, making sure I don't go outside of my trace line. All right, we've got our jig cut and it fits really nice. We was very careful with the router cutting out exactly the line that we, we had traced. And now when we take our fin box, we can confirm that this works as it should. It drops in nice and flush, a um, little bit of a gap. There's supposed to be a little bit of a gap in there so we can get some resin in. That will make sense later. And there's some tabs here that just prevent the box from falling all the way through. 
So what we're gonna do now is put the template on the board and we need to set our router to the right depth. So try to illustrate what we're going for. This is gonna be laying on the board and then we're gonna to have to cut a hole that is the depth of our fin box. And so we can kind of lay it out like this. Leaves are getting in the way a little bit. And then we can take our router and we're using a router bit with a little bearing here. And the bearing prevents you from um, cutting um, into your template. And so now what we're trying to do is we set the depth and I already set it so that with our template, we're just cutting deep enough for the box, but no deeper. And you can see how that bearing is gonna run alongside our template, right? So when we're actually cutting, putting the, the template on the board and you put our router down into the opening, that bearing is gonna just run inside this edge and it's gonna prevent us from wandering out and cutting too big of a, uh, of a hole. So when you, when you have a router and you're just kind of messing with it, it'll make sense. Um, but again, we're using this type of bit. This is a half inch diameter bit. We've got the bearing guide here um, and we've got our template. So now it's just a matter of taping this down to the board in the correct position and get to routering. Got the blue board here ready for its fin box installation. Just gonna walk you through kind of the process of setting up the template. So we have the template here and what I'm doing is, first thing I have to do is get my measurement from the fin box from the tail. For this board, that is seven inches. Um, and again, that's that's off the back of the box, uh, not on the back of the plastic. So the measurement for this board I'm using is off the back of the box, the opening here, to the tail, seven inches for the seven six, and I'm doing about seven and a half inches for the eight foot board. Um, once we get the template in place, um, I put a little bit of tape down just to kind of hold it. And then I'm going to, I use a level just to make sure that the board, the, the, the fin box is not angled to one side or the other. Because we have a lot of um, concave here on the tail, um, it's not gonna sit flush. And so that's why I have these cardboard shims. Um, once I have it kind of taped down in place, I start shimming it um, to really make it stiff and firm and using my level, make sure that it is um, perfectly flat with respect to the board. And uh, one way you can do that is you can level the board, use a flat section of the board and level it on the stand. And then you can then level the, uh, the template itself. And if they're the same, then you know they're on the same plane. So now that I've got this on, it's firmly on there. It's not going anywhere. I can come in and, and use my router and I really don't have to worry about screwing this up. Um, doing all this prep work will make that router cut a lot easier versus doing it without the template. Man, a lot of, a lot of things could go wrong. fin box is routered out and if the job is done well the box should just fit right in. We want to make sure it's sitting flush down on both the front and the back which it is. Looks nice. It's got pretty much not a lot of not a lot of wiggle room but there's a little tiny bit of play um, which is nice because we're going to add a little bit of fiberglass um, when putting this in so having a little bit of play um, is useful. So Perfect. Now it's time to mix up some epoxy, get some fiberglass, and glass this puppy in. We've got our fin box hole taped off and ready for installation. And I've gotten a, a big 10 inch longboard fin and I put in the fin box and this is gonna help us make sure we can guide the angle and the position. It's just easier having a fin in the box um, to make sure that we are sticking this in um, the right way. It'd be terrible to put a fin in and have it off-centered or, or angle, that would be really, really bad. Make the board ride all sorts of weird. Um, so having a, a extra fin to do this is really helpful. Um, we're gonna use the fiberglass method. There's various methods on the internet, but I generally like my boards to be um, stronger, rather, rather than be stronger than weaker. 
And so we just cut a little piece of, uh, this is four ounce fiberglass, it's just what I had. And I've cut this so it'll just fit and wrap up the sides of our box. It'll just get to the top, but not over. And what we'll do is we're gonna get our epoxy and we're gonna mix it with a little bit of micro balloons. Um, also, there's a product called Cavasil. There's a few products out there, but you're looking for super, super fine filler. Um, look for the word micro balloons. And we're gonna give that a, uh, almost like an Elmer's glue um, consistency. And we're gonna saturate this cloth and wrap it around the box, make sure it's nice and wet. Um, we're gonna pour a thin layer into the base of um, the thin box hole, maybe about this much. And the goal with this is you wanna have it enough so when this sits in, that resin is making contact um, with this underside. So it could be really problematic if you cut a hole that was way too big and then put your fin box in but the fin box was bottoming out and not at, or bottoming out on the surface like this and not actually making contact with the base, um, that resin would essentially be doing nothing. So you have to be, you want to make sure when you cut this out, you're cutting it out just enough so the, the base of the box will fit on there. Then we're going to put a thin layer of epoxy with Cavasil in the base. We're going to saturate out our cloth and then we're going to stuff the whole thing in there. We'll be using the same epoxy we've used in the, the entire project so far, just uh, Entropy's clear laminating epoxy. And this is um, the filler I'll be using. This is just a local Florida made um, version of Microspheres. Um, a lot of people call it, there's Cavasil, I think is like a brand name. And this stuff, it's just very, very fine. I wanna be careful, I don't want it to blow into my face, but yeah, it's just very, very fine powder. And I'm gonna probably do about two scoops of that and just work the resin into a Elmer's glue consistency. We've got our resin mixed up and we have that Elmer's glue consistency. It should just be kind of dripping off the spoon. Still has some uh, pr pretty good viscosity. You don't want it to be like thick. It should be runny. And first thing I'm gonna do is come in and I'm gonna pour in just a thin layer into the box. And I've taken, I didn't mention this, I've taken a level and made sure the board is level because you don't want this, um, you know, filling into one side. So you want your board completely level. And our next step, we have our fin box here. And before we put this in, you're gonna take sandpaper and sand this all up um, just so it has more surface area, better bonding. Uh, so I've already done that. And we've got our fiberglass and what I find is that it's easier to kind of get the glass lined up before you put it in the box so that it's symmetric. I've seen some videos where people just put it over the hole and then stuff the box in, but I find the fiberglass kind of goes wherever it wants to go and that's not necessarily a good thing. So I'm going to just use a little bit of resin here and I'm just gonna kind of wet it out so it sticks onto the box. You wanna make sure the, res the fiberglass is wet, otherwise it won't do anything for you. I'm also gonna wet out the sides. I get paranoid that Sometimes fiberglass won't wet out unless I literally wet it out myself. So I'm gonna do that. Once we got this more or less together, I'm gonna pinch the fiberglass as we're having gloves are very important. I'm gonna pinch the fiberglass so it's Symmetric on the box. Come over to the hole and carefully stuff it in and down. You can see all that excess resin shooting up as I push the box in, and we'll just have to clean that up. All right, that came out really good. 
And uh, just some of the things I look for, you know, when I'm laying this up, I wanna make sure that there's resin all in the seam, all the way around. Um, and with these fin boxes, they have like little gaps built in um, where you can drip resin down into the gap. Um, so I just wanna make sure that there's no, you know, there's no resin seeping down into the board, leaving a cavity. So I kind of hang out here just watching for a little bit and just make sure the resin has pulled up nicely. And uh, it looks like that's the case here. It looks really, looks really good. Came out really good. Um, the other thing you gotta really be very careful about is making sure it is aligned. So coming into the back and just being really careful. Um, and you should do this work ahead of time, you know, using just some straight edges. Make sure the fin is, is perfectly straight. Make sure it's straight along the stringer. I tend to look at it from both the front and the back, just looking at that stringer. Um, so just take your time, you know, ahead of time, making sure the box is perfectly lined up because no one wants a board with a fin that's kind of cockeyed. Um, but yeah, this came out really good. And now I'm just gonna leave it and uh, let it dry, let it kick completely um, before we take that fin out. The resin has cured on the fin box and it looks really good. We have a couple areas where over time the resin kind of seeped in so we're going to have to um, fill that in a little bit um, before we are done um, but overall it looks good so now what we need to do is sand away just the excess resin the little you know chunks of fiberglass and because this thin box sits a little proud it sits a little bit high we're going to take some of the plastic down so it's flush with the board so i'm just going to use the uh the orbital sander for that um, with a pretty rough pad i think i've got like 60 grit or something on there and I'm gonna leave the tape on the board so that it, the tape, that's really helpful. It'll tell you if I start hitting um, the board with the, with the pad, the tape will start coming off. And then I know I need to kind of back off. Without tape on, it's really easy to start um, sanding into this pristine glass job. We don't wanna do that. Um, so having the tape on can just make it a little bit easier as we uh, clean up this fin box. This sort of shows you what we were going for with the tape. I've, I've come through and sanded it and our, our box is now flush with the board. It's not popped out at all. And you can see in areas here where I started to hit through the tape with the uh, orbital sander and see how useful it is. I can see, oh man, I'm starting to come through. I'm gonna stop, starting to come through, I'm gonna stop. Um, without the tape and just in general, when you're sanding with an electronic, um, you know, powerful sander, it's really easy to get stuck in one place and then just eat through your fiberglass and be down to, you know, foam and make your board weak. So, um, use tape as your, as your friend in this process. But, uh, now I'm going to peel the tape off and, uh, we're just going to want to go through and add, just do a little tiny batch of resin with filler and just fill in these voids anywhere we see a little bit of a void. I'm just going to come through and just fill that up. I got some here, um, just because I don't want I don't want that void there. We're going to do a gloss coat um, on this board, but I don't really want to use that gloss coat. That's going to be like the last thing we do. Um, I'd rather have these filled in um, prior to that step. It's an exciting day. We've got everything ready to go to sand this board and prep it for its final coat of resin, which we call the gloss coat, um, and that's really going to be just the finishing coat that makes the board look really pretty and nice um, and it may look on the video that the board already looks pretty and nice but what you can't really see is that this coat of resin actually has a bunch of bumps and lumps and it really isn't like perfect it's it, it's great but it's not perfect and so what we need to do before we apply the gloss coat is to make this board completely smooth um, all the way around and to do that I think um, for using just sort of backyard tools um, I'm gonna be using a combination of approaches. The first thing I'm gonna do is start with 40 grit paper on my block, and I'm gonna really focus on the flat surface of the board. And the nice thing about this is it allows you to distribute your sanding pressure along a big area, and so you're less likely to maybe sand in one particular spot. And what I find this does really well at is it, it kind of illuminates where my high points are. So particularly on this board, because we have these laps here, these laps, there's a little tiny bit of a ridge here. This lap, because this has three layers of glass, that has two. This is gonna be a little bit higher. And so this line is gonna be kind of a high point that we wanna take down. 
And when I come through here with this sandpaper and go like this, it's gonna illuminate that. That high point's gonna start sanding and it's gonna become very clear where the high points are. Once I've gone through the flat side sections on the top and the bottom, and I really know where my high sections are, I'm gonna come in with the orbital sander and just hit those high sections really fast. I find that if I just use the, the sanding block, it takes forever. Whereas with the orbital sander, I can, I can knock those high points down really fast. And in particular, again, that's gonna mostly be the seam of our lap. Um, and then the final um, process is to do the rails and doing the rails with either a flat block or a small orbital sander like this is pretty tough. What I like to do is just take a piece of sandpaper, wrap it like this. I'm gonna put the board in the, uh, in the uh, stand on its side so I can get a good look at the rails. And I'm just gonna really carefully sand the rails flush. Um, there's other ways to do it. Um, professionals usually use like a big sander that has like a foam disc. I don't have one of those, um, but I find with, with these three tools, I can get it knocked out pretty quick. So let's get to it. This just shows what you can do with the block. See this line here, that's our high spot from our seam and see how clear that has become by just doing a couple passes with the, uh, with the sandpaper on the block. So now if I have any high parts that I think are particularly high or stubborn, I can get those down really fast with the orbital sander. <laughs> Got the board all sanded. It doesn't look as pretty on the camera, but it's much smoother. Um, and, and again, our goal with that was to just make the glass completely smooth. And now when we apply our final gloss coat, it's gonna be perfectly smooth uh, without any lumps. So um, once we've done our sanding, next step is just to make sure we remove all the dust, um, get some denatured alcohol with a rag and just carefully get any dust off of this before we move on to the gloss coat. And we're gonna do our gloss coat outside, which is a little risky because there's bugs and all sorts of stuff, um, but we don't really have any options because we don't have a garage. So to, to accommodate that, we are going to use a tent, which is kind of novel. And we're going to do the gloss coat first over here and then quickly take it over to the bug-free tent and leave it there on the cooler upside down to hopefully uh, cure without getting any bugs stuck in the gloss coat. Because if a bug gets in here and then tries to run away, it's gonna totally make it look bad. So uh, that's the plan. Now I just need to break out the tape and prepare the, uh, we're gonna do the underside first. So let me get the tape and we'll uh, walk through how we set that up. The board is nice and clean and we've got our tape job done. And I just wanna walk you through this tape job because it's a little bit different than what we did before. So up on the front, we're doing the same kind of tape job. We're going about halfway down the rail and we have our little, uh, our little standoffs to hold the tape off so that excess resin can drip off. But as we move towards the back, we're gonna wanna kind of capture some extra resin so that we can create a hard edge on the back of the board. And that's gonna help the board turn when you're standing on the tail. And the rule of thumb I've seen on different forms is around 20 to 24 inches off the tail is where you want that, that hard edge to smooth transition rounded rail to happen. So what we're gonna do is right around 24 inches, just around here. So it's sort of like right in front of the fin is where the transition happens. We're gonna go from having our tape middle rail and then we're gonna start coming up and bring the tape all the way up to the edge. And in the back portion of the, of the board, we actually have a little bit of extra tape all the way around, kind of proud, standing high above the board. You can see it over here too. And what that's gonna allow is when we add resin here, it's gonna allow the resin to kind of accumulate a little bit um, just around the rail. Some people refer to this as the bead of resin. And uh, this is gonna allow us to have some extra resin so when we're um, sanding the gloss coat, um, we can make a really hard, um, sharp edge. If we didn't do this, we would just have you know, fiberglass and if we were trying to make a hard edge, that uh, fiberglass would pop out and uh, it would just be a mess. So this is just a little trick with the tape job here to you know, help you capture that resin on the back of the board. Also got to make sure that you tape off your fin box because you don't want any of that resin to go into the fin box. Um, so we've got that done. And 
for applying the resin, we're actually gonna use a roller for this job. Um, we've done jobs where we do the gloss coat with the, with the brush. Most people do do it with the brush. One problem I found with the brush is I struggle, and it's probably my technique. I struggle to not have like seam lines, um, especially if you use like a smaller diameter brush. But I've I've never had that problem with these um, short foam rollers. Um, plus, I don't really want this to be a very thick coat. And with the paintbrush, um, I'm more likely to kind of goop it all on. Whereas with the roller, I can really regulate a thin layer um, all the way on. I really like these brushes um, for applying thin coats of epoxy. Um, we, we discovered these the first time we were building the teardrop over there. Um, it worked really well. So I'm gonna try that on this. And the goal is just to do a nice thin coat all the way around uh, on the rails with a little bit of resin accumulation in the back to help us get that hard edge. And then once we are done, we're gonna take it into the bug tent. All right, it's the morning after. We've let the uh, the two boards gloss coat kick in the anti-bug tent and uh i don't know this is definitely one of the weirder ways we've ever done this but i kind of feel like it might work really well let's take a look pull the boards out and see how it looks there they are we've got our uh, plastic um, guard down on the bottom and man they, they actually look pretty good i don't see any bugs stuck in them i think we might have uh we might have achieved our goal here blue board is looking awesome i just wanted to show you pulling the tape off and it looks like we achieved our goal. You can see that we've got a nice, nice little bead of excess resin here, right? You, if you look close, see all that excess resin? So that's exactly what we wanted on this trailing edge. And we're gonna be able to, to shape that resin to make a nice sharp edge. But yeah, this looks really good. I'm super stoked. Now that we have the tape off, we can kind of look at this gloss coat on the green board. It looks really nice. Got the blue board there in the background. And uh, really happy how this gloss coat came out, um, especially doing it outside. That tent trick, I think, is uh, really helpful. So I'm going to save that old tent and use it for this kind of stuff in the future. Um, so next, we have to put the gloss coat on the deck of the board. <clears throat> but before that, we're going to want to do a little bit of sanding, um, particularly here in the back where we have this this edge. So we built this edge up with a little bit of excess resin and I'm just going to carefully sand this down to give us a nice hard edge before we tape off the deck for the uh, top gloss coat. Um, should only take a second. Um, we're also going to take our sandpaper and we're just going to sand this this uh, ridge, this edge where the uh, gloss coat ends because we want this to be set up for a nice smooth transition. Um, so we're going to sand it nice and smooth I'm not going to go over onto this side, just the just sanding the, the seam itself, go around the perimeter and uh, set that up for success for a nice uh, smooth transition for the deck gloss coat. All right, we're all taped up and ready for our deck coat, um, our deck gloss coat. I think it's a little easier to apply and to show the tape job upside down. So this is the underside of the board and we're going to be actually uh, coating the deck. Um, but what we're doing here, it's the same as what we've done before. We're going to bring bringing the tape just up um, and going just above that line of where the previous layer um, ended so that we get gloss all the way around and then the tape's gonna help that excess resin if there is any kind of drip off. And the main difference is we're gonna do that same transition um, to the back because now we have, we have a nice sharp edge here. Um, we've worked on that from um, putting the resin on, on this layer of the board on the underside, um, but now we wanna preserve that edge. And so instead of wrapping the tape around here, we wanna have that resin go all the way around here. So this tape is actually flush right out to the edge. And then we transition over um, where that hard edge, so it's a sharp edge here, rounded rail here, and then that tape is gonna transition over to the that, uh, that regular kind of alignment. So that's what it looks like. We've got our standoffs, just like we've done before to help the dripping. 
And uh, so pretty straightforward. Gonna flip this over, clean it with denatured alcohol, make sure it's completely dust free, and then carefully apply the resin um, before putting it in the dark bug tent. All right, our gloss coat is finished. We've got the deck and the underside of the board nice and glossy, looking beautiful. I didn't show the actual application because it looks just like what we did on the other side. Got the tent in the background. It did the job wonderfully. And uh, we're now on to the final step of finishing these boards, which is very exciting. And that is to wet sand the whole board. So the gloss coat, you could leave it as this, just like this. Um, it, it looks pretty good. It's not perfect. You can see kind of a little bit of dimpling. And uh, I've had good success wet sanding my boards before finishing them. Um, so I'm going to start wet sanding the heck out of this. Um, I'll probably start with a block um, at 120, just with a dry piece of paper, just to kind of take off any little imperfections. And then I'm going to go to probably... 220, 320, 400, and uh, maybe even finer than that. We will see. Um, after the 120, it's gonna be wet sand, so I'm gonna use water, and I'll show you what that looks like. And we're just trying to polish this board down. At first, it's gonna kind of make the board look hazy, and we're gonna lose some of that shine. Um, but as we get down to the uh, to the really fine paper, that shine's gonna pull back out, so don't don't worry about that. So uh, let's get to it, lots of, lots of sanding, but we're on the home stretch of finishing this board. So with wet sanding, it's a little bit different than with regular sandpaper. Obviously it is wet, so we put a bunch of water on the board. Being next to a hose is really helpful. And we're starting, we got it down to, we're at 400 grit wet sand here. And using a block is essential. Um, just put the, the paper on the, the pad like this. And basically just, you know, have fresh water on the surface and then just carefully start polishing. Um, you can really feel the uh, the grit of the wet sand really making the board smooth, and I can already feel it. It's like glassy smooth, and we're only at 400. We'll get up to 800 or 1200, and the more we do this, the more that that shine is going to come out of the board. Um, some some tips are to make sure that you you don't want to move on to the next grit of sandpaper until you get all the scratches out from the previous grit. So. You really want to be very careful going around the board, making sure you've you've gotten it as smooth as you can with the paper that you're using before you move on to the next uh, highest grit of paper. So I'm just, you know, this is a very satisfying part of the project because you're you can feel like you're really close to finishing the board. So I'm just taking my time, enjoying it, and uh, doing the bottom side first, and then I'll move on to the deck and uh, making progress. Once I got to 600 grit of wet sand, the board felt super smooth and I just couldn't wait any longer. I had to wax it up, get the fin in it, and uh, I'm gonna take these things to the beach. We've got some swell coming here in Florida. Um, so that's the end of our video. I really, really appreciate you joining me. I hope that this video was helpful for you in your home building surfboard projects. I'll be sure to put links in the description below of any materials that we used and where you can get those materials um, yourself. And uh, I'll also give you guys updates in the uh, description about how these boards ride. I mean, they are super weird. I have no idea if this is gonna work or be a total disaster. So I'll be sure to update you as I ride the boards more, let you know what's working, what's not, um, in case you wanna build a board like this. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, if you wanna support videos like these, head on over to waterlust.com, uh, get yourself a pair of board shorts, uh, leggings, all this exciting swimmer that we use to communicate science and advocate for the marine environment. We really, really appreciate your support and uh, it really motivates us to uh, keep making fun videos like this. But anyway, leave some comments if you have any questions. And again, thank you so much for joining me.